Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America. This episode is brought to you by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study within 18 undergraduate degree programs. Contact UT Martin today to find a program that's right for you. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm Scott Williams, your host. Emma, before we get started with the podcast, what did you discover at Discovery Park of America this week? Well, Scott, this week I learned Matthew Brady is known as the father of photojournalism. During the war, Brady spent $100,000 to create over 10,000 plates. He expected the U.S. government to buy the photographs when the war ended, but when the government refused to do so, he was forced to sell his New York City studio and go into bankruptcy. Thank you, Emma. Um, This week, I learned that Matthew Brady spells his first name with one T, which is a proofreader's nightmare. So um, we have a very special live episode of Real Foot Forward for our listeners today who normally listen to um, our podcast. It might sound a little different. Um, If you like podcasts, be sure you go and download and listen to our Real Foot Forward podcast. Um, We uh, have a lot of fun talking to people from throughout the region. Today's very special guest is Dr. Timothy Smith. Dr. Smith received his BA and MA from the University of Mississippi and his PhD from Mississippi State. He currently teaches history at the University of Tennessee at Martin among many, many other things, apparently writing books is one because he has written more than 20 books on topics ranging from Shiloh to Champion Hill to Vicksburg to our topic today, Grant. We'll put a link to his Amazon author page in the show notes of the podcast, and we have some of his books up in the store, and he'll be there um, to uh, sign them and meet you um, after today's segment. Dr. Smith was featured um, Dr. Smith was one of the featured historians last year on a three-night mini-series on the History Channel titled Grant. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, I'm a total documentary nerd, so I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, the documentary and your involvement. But first, we want to find out a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Uh, things like that. Okay. I was born in Meridian, Mississippi, and uh, consider myself a Mississippian. I'm a transplanted uh, uh, Mississippi and now up in Tennessee, but I uh, grew up in Mississippi, and uh, really my fascination with the Civil War began uh, as a result of that. Basically grew up between Shiloh and Vicksburg, and we would go, you know, numerous weekends and all over the place to, to battlefields and, and so on. So um, I think my my heritage and, and uh, childhood and all that definitely had a, an impact on, on uh, what eventually came. Um, but just a uh, regular childhood, uh, always loved history, and and, uh, fortunate enough to be able to make a living at it now. At what point did you decide that you really wanted to pursue history as a career? Well, uh, there is actually a very specific point. Um, I went to, well, actually, this being Military Weekend, it's uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, Out of high school, I applied for the Naval Academy and wanted to join the Navy and oh, how my life would be different now had had I done that. Uh, Got a nomination from Senator Trent Lott and um, went through the process and so on, but I've got terrible eyesight. I have to wear glasses, contacts, and and so on, and in those days, and it's been 30 or so years ago, uh, you had to compete for a waiver and there were only just very few waivers for people with bad eyesight, and those were very competitive. You had to be the top of the top to get one of those waivers, so I didn't get it and didn't go to the Naval Academy then. So I went to uh, the probably the second best school in America, uh, Ole Miss. I'm looking at Adam Wilson, my Ole Miss colleague back there, um, and uh, went to uh, Ole Miss and really just bopped around like many freshmen do for the first couple of uh, semesters. In fact, in my whole academic career, I've made three C's, and two of those were in history, of all things, uh, and one in English. I'm minoring in English, so um, really didn't know what I wanted to do, really didn't, you know, have a, a purpose as yet, and so on, but then I took one specific class that was history of the Old South, and I'm guessing, Adam, that Dr. David Sansing was already gone once you, yeah, Adam's uh, uh, 
a little younger than me, but um, it was his last class before he retired, and he was the epitome of the Southern gentleman and, and just, you know, uh, just fascinating taking that class. And I was sitting there one day, and I, I distinctly remember it, it, it hit me, that is who I want to be. That's what I want to be when I grow up kind of kind of thing, you know. So I set my mind to it and, and went on, got the degrees and so on. And uh, not that I have become him by any means, uh, still look up to him and, and so on. He's passed away now. But um, uh, fortunately, I've been able to, to continue in that, uh, at least that uh, similar vein of, of work. Now, I know you've got uh, young children um, young teenager, one of them. So for the young folks who are in the audience, um, you've probably thought about what you recommend to people who are young. How can you make history interesting to them? Or how, what, should, what should parents do uh, to uh, help young people discover how exciting history can be? Well, I think one of the keys here is to go to historic places and the National Park Service and you know Colonial Williamsburg, the Discovery Park of America makes history interesting to, um, to kids these days. There's tons of interactive things that, um, that they get involved in. And so on our vacations, we, uh, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we do the Disney stuff and the cruise stuff and, and all that kind of stuff, but I always try to at least hit in some kind of, of historical something and my girls actually have really started to enjoy it. And they want to know, what park are we going to next? Where, what are we going to, you know, on this vacation? They still want to go to the beach, of all things. I can't understand the beach, but um, too much sand, sun, and water for me. But uh, they want to go to the beach. But you can find historic things uh, even around, you know, the beach and, and uh, get them involved in that. Uh, if you like to read, uh, one of the things I try to do in my classes um, is to include supplemental reading, not just the textbooks. And I use Professor Coffey's textbook in my military history courses, uh, and it's a very good read. Uh, but there are opportunities there to tell students and to teach students and to show students that there are history books out there that are absolutely fun to read. That, you know, most people think, well, I'm going to read a boring old history book. But there are some that read more like an adventure story or a novel or something like that, that, that you get hooked on it and you can't put it down. And those are the kinds of books I try to utilize in my classes that students come away and say, and, and I've even had students, I had one just uh, this semester that she took my classes probably, probably 15 years ago, and she still emails me every once in a while, Tell me some good books. What are some good books that I can be reading now? And I loved your books when you assigned them and so on. So uh, that's another way that we can hopefully get, get kids involved. Now, do you put your books on that list sometimes when you uh, send it to her? Well, actually, for something like that, I've, I've never assigned my book in a class or anything. But, uh, but something like that, I've told her a couple of them. Because students are always interested, you know, what books you, you've written and so on. And I've had students come back and want me to sign them and, and so on, you know. And, and um, I'm terrible with names and... A lot of times I don't remember their names. And now I, I don't even pretend to remember, you know, somebody from 20, 15 years ago or something. Because I learned my lesson. I had a student come back one time and said, uh, said can you sign my book for me? And, and I, I recognized her face, but I had no idea what her name was. So I thought, I'm going to wing it. And so I put, to a former student, so-and-so, so-and-so. <laughs> and she came back all disappointed looking later on. And she said, could you make it out to me personally? <laughs> I said, sure, if you'll tell me your name. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, but uh, you get caught like that, so I don't even pretend anymore sometimes. Well, you, you've written a lot, and so I'm curious, which, uh, that takes a lot of research, obviously. I'm curious, what do you like better, the research part or the writing part? Well, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I can tell you what I like least, and that is the indexing part. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, I've always said if the index comes first, there would never be a book written because that, by the time you get to the index, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and you know it's just a you know, push and get through it and, and be done with it. Um, I love the research part. It is, it's like a treasure hunt, you know, to go into the different archives and the Library of Congress and the National Archives and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I love to travel anyway, and so it's fun to, uh, you know, to go these to these different different repositories and, and uh, uh, you know, when they close, go to the Smithsonian for two or three hours. It stays open till like nine or something, you know. So that's a lot of fun. When... Um, you get past that point though and start the writing process. That's a lot of fun too. I like taking raw material and organizing it and shaping it into something um, that's 
hopefully readable and, and usable, you know. And so I guess it's kind of like the seasons. You know, by the time spring comes, I love spring, but by the end of it, I'm kind of ready for summer. And then when summer gets here and you get the hot weather and all that, by August, I'm ready for fall time, you know. So it, it, every book, it's a continual cyclical process that uh, I enjoy all aspects of it as, as they come along. If I had to do nothing but research, I'd probably get tired of it. If I had to do nothing but writing, I'd probably get tired of that. Um, if I had to do nothing but indexing, I would quit. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, were you working on anything when the pandemic hit and have been unable to get into the libraries? Uh, actually, no. I was uh, in the process of doing a, a book that is just about to come out here in, uh, in a month or so. And I had actually already done the majority of the research where I needed to go to the places that are still shut down, like the National Archives and Library of Congress and so on. And uh, so it really didn't, didn't hit me. And then I could start working on something else and be doing the basic, uh, basic parts of it before I you know, had to do the in-depth uh, manuscript research and, and so on. Um, working on a project now, though, that I'm about to be caught um, that I, 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 the main papers that I need to utilize as a biography uh, or semi-biography are at Tulane University. And Tulane University doesn't allow anybody on campus if you're not a student or a faculty member or something like that. So I've been emailing them, when are you going to open it back up? And I'm hoping, i got to speak in New Orleans next month, and I'm hoping at the end of this semester um, they'll open back up and allow me to come in and do the research while I'm already in New Orleans, you know. So, um, hope, so I'm, I'm on the cusp of being caught. Uh, and I hope it hope it doesn't happen. So, but I've been fortunate so far. What's your What's your biggest eureka moment when you're researching? What's the the What have you discovered while you're researching that you really wanted everybody to know? Um, I probably again like the treasure hunt stuff. Uh, in my field in the Civil War, most of the uh, reports and correspondence and all that has been published by the federal government. It's called the Official Records of the War of the Rebellion. Um, and it's 128 volumes, and some of these volumes are like 1,200 pages thick. You know, they're, they're a huge set of, um, of Civil War material, uh, but it's not comprehensive. There are reports and correspondence and all that that's still out there. And so when you find something in a tucked away archive somewhere that you really need, but you didn't know it was there, and then you find it, it's like Eureka, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a great, great, treasure hunt. So it's a great diamond in the rough, if you will, to, to find something like that. So how, did, how were you first approached to see if you'd be interested in participating? Well, I just got an email. From Leonardo day. DiCaprio? From, no, it wasn't from him, but uh, one of the, the um, uh, editors or, or whoever it was, the, the main project guy, and I uh, wanted to know if I would, you know, be interested in helping them out and, and so on. And um, you know, you, you never know when you get emails like this. Um, that I believe they said straight up, you know, we're doing this for History Channel and, and so on like that. Uh, I get a good many emails like this. The, um, um, what was the show? There's several shows, I think, where they take a celebrity and look into their ancestors and find out if their ancestors were uh, famous or, or, or whatever. Sure. I've had, uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. I yeah. don't remember the name of the yeah. show, but I've had several of those contact me and, you know, looking at research and, and so on. Um, and so you never know really what to expect and whether it'll come to anything, but this one uh, actually did. And, you know, I'm, I'm always willing to, to help out. Uh, they don't always turn out like something like this, you know, where you're on screen and, and all of that. But uh, uh, it was just, uh, just an email. I have no idea where they got my name. Uh, I assume from, you know, the, the books or, or whatever that, that uh, speaks for itself, I guess. But uh, I would guess somebody along the line that they were talking to said, hey, you need to talk to this guy Smith down in Tennessee or, or something. You know, a lot of it is word of mouth of, of who else would you recommend type stuff. So that, that may be how it, it came about. And so uh, they, um, assuming, flew you somewhere to film, where did, where did they fly you to? They flew me to New York City, actually. It was downtown Manhattan, and um, that in and of itself was not such a big deal to me. I mean, most people, you get to go to New York City, people say, wow, that was, that was cool, but uh, I didn't lose anything in New York City that I need to go back to, to, to find, to tell you the, the honest truth. I've, I get to New York City once ever two years or so, either speaking or research or, or something like that. And so I've been in New York City numerous times and really didn't care to 
go back. I mean, obviously, I, I didn't mind it, but it was not a, a destination. In fact, they, um, they told me, they put me up in a hotel, you know, and, and we did the filming the next morning. And they said, hey, we'll, we'll give you an extra night in, in uh, New York City. We'll pay you for a hotel for an extra night if you want to stay and do some tourist things and all that. And I, I politely declined. I really didn't, you know, I've, I've seen most of everything. Had my wife been with me, she, uh, I normally take either one of the other of my girls or my wife uh, on a lot of these research trips or, or uh, speaking events and, and so on. And my wife pulls rank when she wants to go somewhere specific. And she loves New York City, so she normally goes with me to, to New York City. But she's a teacher and, and couldn't go this time, so I, I said, ah, that, that's okay. The um, only thing I wanted to do is uh, when I was up there, and I had time that afternoon, actually, before we did it the next morning, I wanted to go to the Intrepid Museum, the aircraft carrier. I uh, had already been there, but uh, one of my interests outside of the Civil War, just for purely, um, you know, personal interest, reading and so on, is uh, space history. And so they had moved the space shuttle Enterprise, not one of the major three that went up into space, but the, the test uh, shuttle. And uh, they had moved it to the Intrepid Museum, and I wanted to go see it. I'd never seen a space shuttle. I saw one lift off one time, but I'd never been up close to one. And so I went to the Intrepid Museum again, and, of course, uh, the World War II Navy is also a, an interest of mine, so I didn't mind seeing the ship again. That was a lot of fun. But lo and behold, they had the, the space shuttle hangar closed that day, and I didn't get to see the, <laughs> the, the space shuttle. So next time I go to New York City, I guess I'll have to go back to the You Intrepid, take that extra so. night the next time I, you go. I'll take that extra night the next time, I guess. So, so ha did they give you a uh, general idea of what they were going to be asking you? So did you prepare any, or did you just have everything up in your head already? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is kind of the thing you don't really prepare for, and I think it's better maybe that way. Uh, they did send along a list of questions. Whenever I do these things, in fact, I did a, uh, um, one of these interviews for the Blue and Gray Education Association earlier, I guess earlier this week, uh, and they send questions out ahead of time, and I actually kind of prefer it like we do it. I know you kind of told me a little bit about what we may talk about, um, but it's kind of fresher on your mind, I think, and comes out more, um, uh, I don't know, it, it just it just seems better when you don't really can't fabricate an answer you know and is is fresher um, so they they sent me some and i uh, I balked a little bit about a couple of them maybe uh, just give you an example and I don't think i'm I'm uh, telling anything I shouldn't but one of the questions was about this myth of what's called the angel's glow I don't know if you've heard of that that supposedly at shallow these um, these high school history, I think it was high school history students, uh, did some kind of research and they came up with this, this something about the algae in the bodies at Shiloh, um, did something and made the bodies glow at night after, after the battle and it's called Angel's Glow. And uh, this has been around, it's an old wives tale, there is no documentary evidence whatsoever that this occurred. And but it's been picked up and, and has become kind of a, a thing, you know, and I, I mean, certainly high school students are good students and do good and so on. But I wouldn't I wouldn't base my history, you know, on a research paper by a high school student and something this this big, you know, and and uh, and so on. So uh, they actually had a had a question on that. And I told them I, I don't think I would go there because, you know, it's not going to do any good for you probably so uh, and they didn't they didn't ask about that but they yeah they gave some some uh, questions before you yeah that's interesting the um, if you haven't seen the documentary I really recommend it I, I watched it um, with uh, ear um, things on so that I wouldn't disturb my wife but the battle scenes are so real and you can literally hear the bullets whizzing around your head if you're listening to it that way. Um, and it was, it was a much higher production level than you ever see on most documentaries. I mean, I, I thought it turned out really well. Were you happy with the way it turned out? Um, yes and no. Uh, and not, I mean, I, I had no influence on anything except me sitting in a chair like this answering questions. And then, you know, I, in fact, they, this was... I think I flew up in like November, and I didn't hear anything from them for like 18 months. And then I get an email saying, hey, it's coming out next month, you know. And I'm like, oh, cool, that's, that's good. And then you start cringing, thinking, okay, did I say anything stupid? And did, uh, surely, goodness, they won't put that in there, you know. But um, 
the as it turned out, uh, I was I was happy with the academic side of it and the um, the presentation of Grant and so on. And I don't know that I said anything stupid. I was fine with with what they 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 took care of me and didn't didn't put the stupid things I said in there. Um, the reenactment part, the drama part. This was called what they bill it at a docudrama or or something like that. Um, uh, and in, in most cases, I don't have a problem with that either because I know the audience that it was intended for. It was intended for the 99.7% of Americans out there who know nothing about Grant or know just very little. They're not Civil War scholars in depth, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's who it was aimed for. And in that sense, the drama part catches you, it brings you in, and uh, the academic part and historians and all that I thought were very good. Now there's that 0.3% of Americans out there that know how many stitches are in a uniform coat or what kind of um, weapon would have been carried or what kind of trenches would have been dug at Fort Donaldson and, and all that kind of stuff, and they absolutely picked it apart and said, this is terrible, this is awful, this is the worst thing to come out of the History Channel and so, 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 because it wasn't technically accurate in, in, in so and so. And there's some, I mean, there's, there are a little bit of clunkers in there. The, the trenches at Fort Donaldson are nowhere near accurate in terms of, of uh, history and, and, and so on. So um, there, there are some issues with that, but again, if you keep the big picture and keep in mind the audience that it was intended for and the purpose to draw into, just like we were talking about with, with kids and so on, um, to draw into uh, a realm that's never been explored by the vast majority of Americans. And I think it did a, a good job in that, and I think it served the purpose that it was intended for well. And so in that, I was happy with it. So a lot of people, a lot of people know that Grant is on the $50 bill. They know the riddle, who's in Grant's tomb. Um, I'm familiar with Grant, the Grant uh, Memorial at the Capitol is probably one of my favorite. Um, it's the largest equestrian statue in the United States. Uh, but for people who don't know much more than that, how do you describe Grant when you're introducing him to, what's, what's the elevator speech for Grant? Well, what's interesting about Grant is that he could be any of us sitting in this room right here, and you saw a little bit of this on the, the film just a second ago, but um, has a pretty rough life uh, up until he becomes, you know, uh, involved in the Civil War. Um, went to West Point, uh, just a common man, uh, actually resigned from the Army uh, due to, most people said, drunkenness, and I mean, people deal with all kinds of issues and demons, you know, that's, that's a, a common thing. And so Grant is just, he's, he's one of us. He's, he's just like us. And uh, he catches bad breaks. How many of us have not caught bad breaks in our lives, you know? Uh, at the point that by the beginning of the Civil War, he's working for his father in his dry goods store. He's a clerk working for his daddy. And so if you're, I mean, it's, it's one thing to work for your daddy when you're a teenager or something, but if you're 30-something years old, got a family and kids, and so out of luck that you got to take a hand out from your father probably is, is pretty bad. But um, I think the life lesson is don't give up. Stay in, in the fight. And within three years, Grant is commanding the armies of the United States, and within seven, he's president of the United States. My how things turn around, so yeah. don't give up. That's great. Um, I know that uh, Grant suffers from a, from a reputation that is bad sometimes, good sometimes, and, and evolves as we evolve through history. Uh, one biographer, William B. Hesseltine, noted that Grant's reputation deteriorate, deteriorated because his enemies were better writers than his friends. I'm curious what, what, you, what role you think the media had to do with Grant's reputation through the years? Well, I mean, that's a topic for today, is it not, and the, the whole thing about uh, the media and its influence on America today, um, whether good or bad, whether you agree with it or, or not, but uh, the thing is, not much that we're facing today, everybody thinks these are the worst times of the worst and all that, but not much is going on today that hasn't already gone on 
in the past. And Grant faced the same kind of things that, uh, uh, that many are facing today in terms of the media, uh, sometimes just flat out wrong, just, just purposefully flat out lying about him, uh, about his, you know, his drunkenness and, and all of that. And so, um, you know, it's, it's amazing the extent sometimes that the, the media will go to, and it's not always flagrant. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm sure you get a lot of newspaper coverage here. When I worked at Shallow, we did a lot with, you know, press releases and newspapers and so on. And sometimes it's accidental. Um, we would send out a press release and word it just like we wanted to, and for some reason they would have to edit it and get it all messed up and, and completely change things around, you know, and I'm like just print what we send you but um, so sometimes it's it's flagrant sometimes it's not but Grant faced that absolutely uh, in his uh, early years as he's trying to reestablish himself and then obviously when he's president of the United States you know there are Republican newspapers there are Democratic newspapers and never the twain shall meet so. um, for people out here who are interested in what you're talking about what what's the book that you recommend people go to first to learn more about Grant Oh, well, as Professor Coffey talked about, there are different levels of grant studies, uh, and there is actually, in terms of and getting to graduate school here, the historiography of Grant, uh, there's been a rehabilitation of Grant's image in terms of his present, most, most you know, people... Popular history think of Grant as the worst president we've ever had, and he's a drunk and a butcher and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's really been a rehabilitation going on in the last 10, 15 years or so of Grant's image. Um, and a lot of that comes from the big books that have been published recently, like Ron Chernow that you mentioned, uh, Ronald White. Uh, I probably would not recommend starting with those because they're about eight or 900 pages. They're book stops or door stops that, you know, probably you don't need to sink your your teeth into immediately. Um, there is actually a book that the University Press of Mississippi put out uh, recently that, and you know, you know the whole deal about the Grant Papers and the Grant Presidential Library now at Mississippi State University, which is an, an odd thing in, in, in altogether. Uh, but there's a there's a uh, story behind that that is self-explanatory. You know, it's obvious why they're they're there if you if you know the story, but. Um, Colleges these days, and UT Martin does it, they assign a book for all students to read and all students to get um, that they're going to use for that semester or that year or whatever, you know, no matter whether you're history or English or, or, or whatever. Um, and Mississippi State actually did a little biography on Grant. And John Marzalek, my major professor at Mississippi State when I was there doing my graduate work, um, wrote it, and it's a real short introduction of Grant, and uh, it's really well done. It's I think the title of it is hold on with a bulldog grip or something like that because Mississippi State, the Bulldogs. And, and uh, that's actually a quote from Lincoln. Lincoln uh, wrote Grant at one point, I believe in the Overland campaign, and said, hold on with a bulldog grip. And uh, John Marzalek says that was just ordained that the Grant papers and the Grant library should come to Mississippi State then as, as uh, bulldogs and so on. So um, that would probably be the starting point, I would say, for the newest scholarship on, on Grant. You talked a little bit earlier about going on trips with your family. Obviously, Tennessee is rich in all types of tourism history. We have Graceland, the Hermitage, Shiloh. Um, tell us a little bit, having worked at Shiloh, what, for anyone who's listening who has never been there, what does uh, one experience when they go there? Well, you probably experience the best preserved Civil War battlefield in America. Uh, most Civil War battles are fought around towns. They're fighting over transportation routes, and normally where those transportation routes cross, there's some type of town or city. And you start naming battles in the Civil War, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, Petersburg, uh, Richmond, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, all these battles, they're fought right around towns. And so when... Um, the second industrial revolution comes along and urbanization starts to, to emerge. Those battlefields, in large part, uh, in many cases, are swamped. Uh, you know, even in Tennessee here, Stones River. They're, they're only about 10 or 15 percent of the battlefield at Stones River is in the national park, and most of it is just urbanized areas, which is, which is very sad. Um, so urbanization takes a lot of those battlefields, but if you go to Shiloh, 
there is nothing even remotely close to a town or a city around, around Shiloh. Uh, it was fought so far out in the isolation of, of the West Tennessee woods that it has, as a result, been very well preserved. And so, in large part, what you see out there at Shiloh today is what you could have uh, seen back, uh, you know, 150 years ago. Um, I've often said if you take a veteran, maybe not from... April 1862 when, you know, the armies are there and all that. But if you take a veteran maybe from uh, the Civil War that was living in the 1880s or 1890s and plop him down into Shiloh today, he probably would recognize the Shiloh of today from what he knew from the 1880s. It just hasn't changed that much. So Shiloh is absolutely a gem, a, a major American treasure, and we are very fortunate to have it right here in West Tennessee. Well, I definitely highly recommend it, and I highly recommend the documentary that you participated in. I thought it was fantastic. I binged watched all three episodes, and it was great, and I really appreciate you joining us here today for Real Foot Forward. Glad to. Enjoyed it very much. Um, And thank you all for joining us in person. Dr. Smith will be upstairs in the Real Foot Room if you want to stop and visit with him for a few minutes. Um, And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day here at Discovery Park. The next panel is at 1 o'clock. So if you want to come back in here at 1 o'clock, we have a panel on uh, minorities in the military that should be really interesting. So thanks so much.